wanted to put together a little video on the evolution of my brain on smartphone. And what I mean by that is probably not the best title, but I've come up with certain processes, certain apps, certain workflows that I think improves my ability to sort through lots of information and apply to the classroom. One of the things we're going to see at the end of this is I really believe that smartphones and tablet devices are really going to improve our ability to socially collaborate. That's one of the last videos that I'm going to show. To that end, I'd like to make a video that contributes to that social collaboration, shares ideas that I've come up with as far as tools that I've found on the phone that improves my workflow. Really briefly first, I'm going to start with ideas that help me stay connected just to answer emails and use Google Voice to respond to text messages. The second wow moment I had is I sat down with my phone over a spring break once and just started downloading apps that allow me to sort through lots and lots of information. I've got apps that help me read lots of different sources, watch or listen to lots of different sources, access my work kind of content, whether it's PowerPoint or Word documents, things like that. Another thing that I really like to do that creates efficiencies for me is to make sure that all of my computers are basically set up the same, whether the bookmarks are the same on all computers, or that the bookmarks are the same on my phone as it is on my computers. These are important connections that in the cloud that help me coordinate my computers. And in essence, I think that helps me coordinate my content, my knowledge. Step three was just to realize that my phone is really a second brain and it can process information much like my brain does. It has a sensory memory to sort through and figure out what information is important. It has a short term memory that allows me to basically store thoughts until I can figure out where it fits into my long term memory. With my long term memory being this complex schema of knowledge, this complex organization of everything that I know and want to apply in the classroom. And the fourth is still pretty nebulous because I don't know that these are mature ideas at this point. How can I create efficiencies in my content so that it can be delivered over a smartphone? And how can I create personal learning networks for myself so that I can share ideas and gain ideas from other people, other instructors who think like me? And how can I get students to form socially collaborative networks so that they can get help to learn information if they're having a problem with certain amounts of information? Can they get help? Can the social crowd, social collaboration improve their learning? So coming back to step one, it really happened three or four years ago, and it was just the innovation of realizing it's really nice to be able to respond to email quickly. Now, I'm not saying that I respond to student email on the drop of the hat, but it is actually kind of nice to respond to it periodically throughout the day. And this just may be me because I don't necessarily like getting 25 emails on a Monday morning. I would rather get to that on a Saturday night when my kids are in bed or a Sunday night when my kids are in bed. Also, I think it greatly improves the student because sometimes that question is holding them up and they can't progress further until that question is answered. So I like to be able to answer that question and improve the communication stream with my students by responding to email. An advancement is to add Google Voice because now I can text message students and they can text message me. A lot of students still don't have smartphones and they might not have ready access to a computer, but they can text you. So they're sitting in the library, they're studying, they have a question, they can text your Google Voice number and you can respond back. They can also leave a phone message. So I often tell my students, don't even call the number that's on my syllabus, that's my desk phone, because I'm rarely at that. Even when I'm on campus, I'm usually in a classroom. And so I won't really be able to respond to that. Call my Google Voice number. I don't necessarily always answer it, but the nice thing about Google Voice is it will transcribe that message and send it to me as email. Now, it's not a good transcription, but it's usually close enough that I can figure out what's going on. The other nice thing is the Google Voice, you'll get that message whether you're sitting at your desktop, if your phone is turned off and because you've been in class, then you'll still get that message through Google Chrome. The next step for me, and I would say this happened a few months ago when I realized that my phone is an infinite source of information, lots of different information. So I don't need to have board minutes when I've got my kids set up and they're all playing on the playground with their friends and I've got a moment off to the side, I can read something on my phone. Or if my daughter is finishing up dance class and I'm waiting for her, I can listen to a podcast. If I'm driving up to campus, I can listen to a podcast. If I'm cleaning up my shop, I'm mowing my lawn, I can listen to a podcast on how someone is using Twitter in the classroom. It fills a lot of space in my life that would otherwise be rather bored and unfulfilling or unstimulated with content that's related to information or things that I want to improve on. Like I'm going to learn completely about how to use Twitter by listening to podcasts. I don't have to sit down and read it. I can listen to the podcast while I'm engaged in some other activity that I need to do for maintenance of my house or family. Different reader apps are important, I think. 
The first one I use is Replico Reader. The thing that I like about Replico Reader is it reads PDFs, but it also allows me to highlight them. One of the things that I do is I store the PDFs in Dropbox, so then I can access those documents on Dropbox. I'll talk about Dropbox later, and I can highlight them. Different sources that you can get on PDFs, you can get books in PDF, academic papers, so if there's a journal or a peer-reviewed article that has some paper on pedagogy, I can store it to my Dropbox, access it with my, with my smartphone, and then highlight it. And Replica Reader will store those highlights so that when you view the document again on the computer, it's still highlighted. One thing I wish it did and it does not do is I wish it would collate the highlighted text into a separate document. Amazon Kindle will do that now for books, but Replica Reader does not do that for PDFs. I like to read the news. I really like Google News because it aggregates news from different topics. But News 360 is really nice on the smartphone or on the tablet. It's just you can sort through what streams you want and you can read the various news articles of the day. I don't use Read It Later a lot because I found other tools I really like Evernote at this point. But what Read It Later I use for a short time it allows you to bookmark and archive a website. And by archive, I mean not just bookmark it, but actually store the content of it so it's available later on your phone even if you don't have internet access or maybe you have a Wi-Fi Zoom and you're not on the Wi-Fi at the time. You will have archived that to your Zoom and you don't need internet access then to read that content. I really like polls. I really have gotten into blogs because it's really nice to hear what other people are thinking. Whether it's a teacher that has this idea, you can read that blog really, really quickly and figure out if it's something that resonates with you. I don't necessarily use it completely for teaching. I, have, I follow blogs on parenting. I follow blogs on coaching soccer since I coach my daughter's soccer team. The nice thing you get about Pulse is it gives you access to blogs. And blogs are really nice because people are sharing socially collaborating ideas with you. And then you can sort through those blogs and figure out what ideas resonate with you and perhaps build on them. OnePlus Reader has kind of a narrow function for me. Perhaps I find an EPUB format book and I want to read it. And I just use Moon Plus Reader. There's other ones, but I like Moon Plus Reader. If I've bought a book from Amazon, I generally will read it on Kindle though. But you can read it on Moon Plus Reader. Web to PDF I like a lot because you can store a web page as a PDF, which means then you can read it in Replica Reader and highlight. Now Digo, which I'll talk about later, will also let you highlight web content so that you can suss out is exactly what you want to remember. But web to pdf actually allows you to store the web content in a PDF, put it in your Dropbox, and then you can access it whenever you want. So it's nice to have web content as a PDF sometimes. Apps that I use to watch or listen, and again, I found tremendous value in having podcasts and being able to listen to things because there's so many moments when you can't just sit down and read something but you can listen and absorb the content if it's auditory. I really like YouTube. There's a lot on YouTube this, these days on pedagogy and on content, so it's nice to be able to just listen to YouTubes. A key adaptation, though, is to use the playlists. So say I'm looking up Twitter and TweetDeck, but I don't have time to watch this video. I can save this video, save for later, and I can save it to a playlist. Now I can easily access that playlist from my phone and just go through those YouTube videos. So it's a key coordination process for me. Amazon MP3, the Amazon Cloud, essentially you can store MP3s. On Amazon server you can store up to 5 gigs and I think it goes to 20 gig if you buy an album. A nice thing is if you are buying music, you can access that music from your phone, your computer, anywhere, and all your computers. So it truly is a cloud. Now a bit of a hack that I don't necessarily think they want you to do, but it's not illegal, is to download podcasts from iTunes U, put them on your Amazon Cloud, and then you can listen to those podcasts. If you try to listen to iTunes U content, it's a little bit tricky to get things to an Android device. Obviously it's really easy to put things on iTunes U on my iPod, but since I don't have an iPhone, I need to use tricks to get them over to my Android. And one of those is Amazon MP3. I download the MP3 with iTunes and then I upload it to the Amazon Cloud so that I can listen to that MP3 from my phone. Another one we'll get to down here is Double Twist, but we'll get to that in a second. Another adaptation now is Pocket Casts. Now, Pocket Cast allows me to listen to various podcasts on my Android phone, but it doesn't necessarily give me access to everything that I could get on iTunes U. So really, it's just podcast oriented. So sometimes the iTunes U things, I still have to use Amazon MP3 or the Amazon Cloud. But there are some nice podcasts that are education-based that are available through Pocket Cast, like Educause, The Chronicle of Higher Education has various podcasts, TED Talks. 
So it's really easy to use Pocket Cast just to download podcasts and listen to those through your phone. Another adaptation that I found is I have some Motorola headphones that will communicate with my phone. They were like $30, $35, that will communicate through my phone wirelessly on Bluetooth. So this is nice because when you're mowing the lawn, you can have your phone in your pocket and it will transmit the Pocket Cast to your headphones. But your headphones are wireless, so you're not catching that wire on everything. So it's really nice for when you have work around the house to have wireless headphones. Double Twist, I haven't really used it anymore, but I used it originally to coordinate between iTunes and the Android. Now I use Amazon MP3, or there's other devices now that will allow you to coordinate files on your desktop computer to your phone. Originally I used Double Twist, I'm going to use AirSync. The AirSync, um, the Double Twist was free and AirSync cost $5. The nice thing about the AirSync was then you didn't have to plug your phone into a computer. You could do it over Wi-Fi. But again, I don't remember the app, but if you search the Android market, you will find Wi-Fi applications now that allow your phone or your tablet to communicate with your desktop Wi-Fi so you don't need to plug them in. And you can pull files over from iTunes U onto your Android phone and store it. Again, maybe the advantage of an Amazon MP3 is when you do it with Double Twist or you do, you pull these files over to your phone, you're taking up your phone's memory. Whereas if you put things on the Amazon cloud, it's being stored on Amazon and you're streaming it to your phone without using up your phone's memory. Work-related apps that allow me to coordinate work or processes or projects that I'm doing for work. Dropbox is invaluable, and if you don't have Dropbox, you need to check it out right now. Probably even stop listening to this and go to Dropbox. What it is, is just a central depository of documents. So say you have PowerPoints, or say your grade sheet is in Excel, something that you want to be able to work on or access from multiple different places. You install this app on your desktop computers, and essentially you're sharing those files across every computer that you have Dropbox installed on and your smartphone. So at the beginning of the semester and I want to look at my PowerPoints or look at my syllabus and I want to work on them, they're in Dropbox. So I can work on it on my desktop computer, I can work it on my work computer, and by desktop I mean my home computer, and I can also access it through my phone. Dropbox is invaluable. You get two gigabytes free and then once you get beyond two gigabytes it starts to cost money, but I've never had a problem because I drop whatever files that I'm working on currently into Dropbox and I pull everything else out. Quick Office, I use this to access and edit Microsoft Office-like products like PowerPoint. It's not real powerful, it's really hard to edit or create these kind of documents on a smartphone, but you can def definitely look them over and review them and make small adaptations and edits. Thinking Space, I'm a big concept mapper. I like to draw things out in mind maps and I like Thinking Space for the phone because it allows me to do that quickly. I don't like this application perfectly because it doesn't really coordinate well with mind mapping software that I use on a desktop computer. It will coordinate with mind mapping software on the desktop, but, but I don't really like those applications. So what I usually end up doing is drawing quick concept maps on my phone when all I have is my phone, and then I'll transform or I'll use those concept maps and feed them into a different application that I use called Bubble Us. Google Docs, my use of Google Docs comes and goes. My feeling about Google is they're awesome because everything is free, but everything is about 80% polished. There's some downsides to almost every app that they use. It's, it's very rarely perfect, but it's free, so I accept it. I like the Microsoft Office cloud-based documents, though, that Google Docs offers. So there's Microsoft Word and Excel-like documents. I would say that it's still better than Microsoft's cloud base because it's constantly accessible. Whereas usually with Silverlight, you have to download the document, edit it, and put it back up. The other thing about Google Docs is it's way more collaborative. I use it when I have students do research projects because they can all work on the same document at the same time. They don't need to email around a Word document. They can all be writing. Technically, they can all be sitting on laptops on their own couches writing the documents at the same time, and it will update. I have historically speaking used Google Docs to keep track of my projects because then I can access my to-do list and my documents from a phone or any computer but I've since moved to Evernote because I find that a little bit more convenient. Connecting to other computers, I find it really important and really efficient that every computer I sit down has certain things that are coordinated whether it's my bookmarks or I can pull files from one computer to the other and so I like certain apps that allow me to coordinate my phone with the computer and coordinate computer to computer. Chrome to phone, if you find a website, you're heading out of the office, you know you want to read this, you can send that website to your phone really quickly with Chrome to phone. Or maybe you're going to make some large purchase like I was going to buy a treadmill. 
and treadmills are expensive so I wanted to be able to search that out I wanted to send certain web pages to my phone so that when I, when I got to the store I would have this web information I liked Chrome to phone now there's better ways to do this on a broad sense to coordinate your bookmarks but if there's a bookmark that you know you're going to want on your phone in an hour or two or you're going to want to read later Chrome to phone works really really nice so again, I like to coordinate. So I like to coordinate all of my bookmarks that are on my desktop computer to my phone, and Chrome Marks will do that. So whatever bookmarks I have in Chrome, it will coordinate and synchronize with Chrome Marks. Not really related to smartphones, but I still wanted to mention it, is you can coordinate all your bookmarks in Chrome. So essentially what this allows you to do is when I sit down at my home computer, my bookmarks are the same as my bookmarks at work and my desktop has the same bookmarks as all my other computers. So that's nice when you add a favorite, all the bookmarks on all your Chrome browsers will update. It's really a simple setting within the options of Chrome under personal stuff, you can sync your Chrome bookmarks. And again, that's nice because I don't have to have three different sets of bookmarks on my desktop computer at work, my desktop computer at home, and my laptop. Everywhere I go, the bookmarks are the same. Splash Top Remote, I haven't used a lot, but I use it occasionally. And to be honest, the main way I used it was I have a Zoom. And Zooms are not very convenient for showing Netflix. But what you can do is remote your desktop computer. And your desktop is playing the Netflix. And it's feeding that or streaming that to your Zoom. And it kind of works kind of well. But I could see where this would be somewhat useful to coordinate between your desktop and your Zoom. So that you can control the desktop, see what's on your desktop with your Zoom or with your smartphone. So that kind of wraps up step two, never board minute. And again, that was a big one because there's a lot of moments in, in my day when I'd like to be able to work on something or I, I really enjoy my brain. I like it when my brain is thinking about something. And to be able to fill time, you have nothing on you except for your phone, to be able to fill that time with thought was really kind of a wow moment for me. That's probably when I decided to teach this class because being able to use those apps really made me fall in love with my phone because my phone had so much information, fed so much to my brain, so to speak. Step three was a really cathartic moment. It was a real wow moment to realize that my phone can process information much like my brain. And so my phone can act literally as a second brain for me. And that was really powerful for me. I don't want to turn this into a psychology class, but essentially I have three different types of memory or a lot of psychologists break down memory into three main different types. Sensory memory is your filter. What's important? What should I pay attention to? Right now there's a cicada in the background. I'm trying not to pay attention to that. I'm not paying attention to my dog barking. I'm not paying attention to the clothes that are rubbing against my skin. What I would be paying attention to is what specifically I'm looking at, I'm looking at the screen. Or if my daughter yells my name, I'm going to attend to that. So that's sensory memory. Filter what's important. And I guess I have a little picture here that demonstrates that. Lots of information coming in. What your working memory does is figure out what's important. So it's a filter. Your short-term memory, you've kind of determined that something's important. It's made it past that first filter, but you don't know exactly where it fits into the rest of the knowledge that you have yet. So you need to file it away. You don't want to forget it, but you don't know exactly where it fits in. It takes some time to figure out where it fits into your long-term memory. So that's short-term memory. Long-term memory is your real complex schema, your huge networks of information that tell you how certain bits of information fit in with others. So that's your long-term memory. A key thing, and this is why my phone became so important, is anytime something doesn't make it along the line, you're going to lose it. So notice down here, information is lost, if not encoded. Information is lost. And this happens in my brain. I have an idea that I think is a great idea, and I will just perseverate on it. I will think about it over and over until I get it written down or until I know that I have it memorized because I don't want to lose that information. But what that means is my brain cannot go on to the next topic. It's still like, don't forget this, don't forget this, this is a great idea. So it's really helpful to be able to have something on my phone that will store this information, know that I'm not going to forget it, and I'll be able to come back to this information. It also allows me to keep that information active in my brain so that I can store it in long-term memory. The other benefit is the more you have in your long-term memory, the more you help this process, the more you help retrieval and remembering. So if I have certain apps that improve my long-term memory, I can actually learn more information more rapidly, and I can proceed and innovate more quickly. Many of these apps I'm going to mention, I'm going to mention them again. I already mentioned them as apps that allow me to not be bored. Many of these apps I've already mentioned, but I'm just going to mention them again because now I'm categorizing the apps as sensory memory, short-term memory, or long-term memory. But again, these are the apps that are going to improve my sensory memory, improve my filter. Most of my apps do that. 
Certain apps allow me to store information until I can put it into long-term memory. I have certain apps that really allow me to coordinate and structure information so that it goes into my long-term memory or even acts as my long-term memory. The first thing before I go through these apps again is I just want to point out one of the keys for getting sensory information sorting is for me to first do kind of a pre-sort. And I think this really helps me a lot in sorting my content, so I wanted to share it here. As I pre-sort all my teaching subject matter into pedagogy, content, and technology, so that when I want to access this information, I know that I'm accessing information on teaching, I'm accessing information that's related to what I teach, so anatomy and physiology, or if I want to just learn about technology, I've kind of got that pre-sort. So if I look at my Dropbox, I divide, divide content into content related to A&P, content related to pedagogy teaching and content related to technology. It's also easy sometimes. It makes it easier to divide things into multimedia or AV content. This is going to be a video and that's going to take up more memory versus something I want to read. Just as an example, and I'm showing this for two reasons. On my iTunes account, these are various podcasts that I've divided up into technology, pedagogy, and content. I put the little A at the beginning so that it's at the top of my list for the most part. But I also want to show this just because there is a lot on iTunes U that's related to technology and how it relates to the classroom. So Back Channel is about Twitter. Just Drop It is a short little podcast on Dropbox. There's TED Talks, Twitter again, Disruptive Innovation. There's a lot of podcasts on teaching. And again, I like to point this out just to show you that there's a lot out there that you could be listening to while you're mowing the lawn. But there's still a lot out there in content. So in AMP, there's a lot of lectures out there. It's nice to just hear how someone else teaches, pick up what they teach, what resonates with you, pull that idea in. And then I can be essentially more innovative if I hear what other people are doing, what's really good that they're doing, and what works for me in the classroom. The basis of this pedagogy content and technology division is something called the TPCK model which I don't want to go into in detail, but I'd like to show it enough that maybe if it's interesting to you, you go off to it. It's generally we think about teachers of having content knowledge, what's related to their field, and then separately they have pedagogical knowledge, knowledge, what works good in teaching. But it's really pretty freeing to realize that there's a whole lot of pedagogical knowledge that doesn't necessarily work with my particular content, which is AMP. I mean, AMP is very content driven and it's very organization of information driven. So there's only a subset of pedagogy that really works with my particular content. I also think as instructors, a lot of times we think as technology as off to the side. Technology is ancillary. PowerPoint has nothing to do with content and pedagogy. Whereas I like this model because there are certain technological innovations that help pedagogy and help content. For example, I think PowerPoint is powerful and it allows much more pictures. And for those that are visual learners, that's a powerful technological tool. Also, PowerPoint will allow you to record your lectures. And allowing a student to listen to a topic a second time is powerful pedagogically and content because they're hearing the content two or three times and there's nothing like hearing something two or three times to really improve someone's learning. So I like this model because it shows you that there is kind of a butter zone, a middle zone where you can improve pedagogy content and technology. They can work synergistically together to create the best teaching environment, so to speak. So I've already kind of gone through these. So I don't really want to go through this in detail, but I'm just pointing out that these are the apps that help me sort information. Pulse, I read a lot of blogs, and I can cull through those really quickly and figure out what resonates with me. It's nice to read a lot of people's ideas and figure out which work for you. Replica Reader allows me to read a lot of different academic papers, books, web pages related to teaching, pedagogy, and content. YouTube, I can watch lots of videos. There's plenty of videos on using Twitter, on teaching ideas, how to innovate with PowerPoint, things like that. There's a lot of videos on anatomy and physiology. Again, if I would like to watch those videos, see how someone else teaches, pull out what works for me, it makes me more innovative. To be able to basically sort through the great of other people and incorporate that great into what I teach. Chrome to phone, if I find a web page that's really, really interesting, I can send it to my phone and I know it'll be on my phone to read later. Amazon Cloud gives me access to iTunes U MP3s on my phone. Doesn't take up memory space on my phone, but I can access these podcasts from anywhere. Moon Plus Reader just allows me to read EPUB books. So Courage to Teach or something like that. Or Makichi is another book that I have in EPUB format. Allows me to read it and highlight it. You can also buy books. I guess I didn't mention this one, but Amazon Kindle has an app for the Android too. 
Pocket Cast. I can listen to podcasts related to teaching. This one's nice because I don't have to go through the whole process of moving podcasts onto my Android. So I don't have to move from iTunes U. I can just download it directly. And again, there's a few of those. It doesn't capture all the podcasts I want to listen to, but it captures a lot of them, like Educos and The Chronicle. Web to PDF, again, allows me to basically save web pages related to content, pedagogy, or technology so that I can read them later. Double Twist, again, not using a whole lot, but again, the key thing for Double Twist is there's a lot of podcasts on iTunes and iTunes U, and you have to figure out a way to get those off of iTunes and iTunes U onto an Android. And Double Twist is one of the ways to do that. Amazon MP3 is another way to do that. Or now there are Wi-Fi programs or apps that, that allow you to coordinate between your desktop and your Zoom or phone and just pull the files from iTunes U onto your Android. Reader is another one that I have used in the past, but I'm not using it a lot now because I prefer Evernote. Evernote is the better, and I'll talk about Evernote in a second. Chrome Marks, one of the things that helps me process information more quickly is to have things synchronized between my computers. So on my Chrome browser, on my desktop, I have a folder of websites related to pedagogy, a different folder related to content, a different folder related to technology. And I synchronize those folders across all of my computers so they show up on all my computers. Chrome Marks allows me to synchronize to my phone too. So if I know that I just I have a free moment and I want to look at web pages related to technology, I have that bookmark folder on my smartphone or on my computer desktop. TweetDeck I haven't really mentioned, but I'm seeing the power of that now and I want to explore this. I think most of us when we think of Twitter, we think of this as celebrities making jokes and telling us that they're shopping at a particular store at the time. But really Twitter is a microblog, so people can share an idea really quickly, throw it out there for other people to see and see if it resonates with them. It happens a lot at conferences where people will Twitter during a speech. It would be very nice to have an ongoing discussion as you're listening to a presentation. To some it may seem rude, but if I can share my thoughts while somebody else is speaking, hear other people's thoughts, I think it creates a richer environment to have kind of a discussion group going as a presentation is ongoing. Another thing is if somebody finds a website and you're following them, you can get that website, check it out really quick, and sort through information. Essentially, you're choosing other people with a like mind to share their filtration process. What has made it through their filter, they put it on Twitter, you get to see it. And you're benefiting from this is somebody I respect or someone that thinks like me. Their filter is worth taking a look at. And that's the benefit of Twitter. TweetDeck allows you to sort those different Twitter streams into, am I interested in this person's tweet because it's related to content, pedagogy? Is it related to soccer? Is it related to parenting? So I'm looking into TweetDeck and Twitter, although I don't have fully formed ideas and conclusions, but I do see the power of it. So again, that's sensory memory, and the main process here is being able to sort through information. It's not like I'm reading every single blog really, really intently. I'm looking at several, several blogs to see if it resonates with me. Or I'm listening to this podcast while I couldn't be doing anything else. If I'm cleaning up the shop or I'm mowing my lawn, I really couldn't be doing anything else. So it's nice to listen to a podcast to figure out if that podcast has information that I can use in the classroom. Once something has made it through that initial sort, I read a blog and I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. I don't necessarily have the time at that point to sit down and suss it out completely and figure out how I'm going to adapt that to my classroom. So I need somewhere to store it, to store ideas. My main one is Evernote, and we're going to see that again in long-term memory because I really like this tool. Essentially, it's a note accumulator. So it's a notebook. Now, I've kept notebooks in the past, writing down your teaching ideas or that's a good thought. The problem with a notebook is you have to have it on you all the time. Or if you leave it at work and you don't have it at home, the nice thing about Evernote is it's online. It's in the cloud, so it's accessible on your smartphone and all your desktops. The other nice thing is you can accumulate those notes in multiple formats. If you're driving in and you're like, oh, don't forget to do this, and you don't want to write it down, you can make a quick voice recording and that will go to your Evernote. Or maybe sometimes I'm walking downtown and I have an idea. Uh, I would like to save that idea, and so I'll record a voice recording and it will go into my Evernote notebook. There's also an app on Chrome that allows you to clip a web page. So if you come across a web page that you really, really like, you can clip it to your Evernote. Sometimes I've jotted down a simple note or a little picture of a little spatial map of thoughts that I'm trying to organize. And I have to be very careful that I don't lose that piece of paper. Otherwise, I've lost that thought. I can take a quick picture of it with my phone and put it into my Evernote. So it's a way to accumulate notes.
While I really like Evernote, there's some things that Digo does that Evernote does not do. So I still use Digo. And Digo is a bookmarking tool on Adderall. So anytime you come up across a page that you want to bookmark, you bookmark it with Digo. But you get the opportunity to add search tags. This should, have, this should have said search tags. You can also highlight a web page, just like you want to highlight words in a textbook so that you can filter out what the specific important points are. You can highlight a website with Digo. Another nice thing coming back to those search tags is when I enter the search tags, if I want to come back to all the web pages that I found interesting that are related to Twitter, I can easily go to those web pages that I found related to Twitter or if they're Web 2.0 tools or things like that. I also, it's not really shown here, but I sub-organize again by content, technology, and pedagogy. So Digo is kind of nice. A nice thing about Digo too, and when you first start getting these emails, this is a screenshot of my email you're going to start getting links sent to you that other people have found interesting. Which it can be kind of a pain because I don't want this email sent to me every single day. But it's kind of nice because other instructors are calling through what they found online and sharing with you the specific websites that they found very, very powerful. So it's a socially collaborative tool too. So it introduces again the overall theme of this little video is social collaboration, seeing the power of social collaboration, calling from other people's ideas to improve your innovation. And I really like Digo for that. It's allowing me to see what other people are seeing as imp important. Power Notes is a smartphone-based companion to Digo. It's not as powerful as I'd really like to see, but it does help somewhat. I prefer to actually use Evernote. Thinking Space is a concept map or mind mapping tool. Probably a better term is mind mapping tool. I like to draw things out visually so I can see the relationship. So I use Thinking Space for quick brainstorms on my phone. A disadvantage is, is it will coordinate with web-based concept mapping tools, but not necessarily the concept mapping tools that I like. I don't remember exactly who it coordinates with, but it will coordinate with mind mapping tools online. But I like a different mind mapping tool called Bubble Us, and unfortunately Thinking Space does not coordinate with that. But if you want to quickly jot down ideas and you know it's going to benefit from a spatial organization, I still use Thinking Space. I just then take those ideas, since it's kind of a short-term memory kind of thing, and plug it into Bubble Loss, which is the more complex concept mapping software I use. So those are your short-term memory tools. Once you've decided that something's important and it's made it through your working memory, but maybe you don't have time to figure out exactly how it fits into your long-term memory, but you need to have a placeholder, a parking lot, so that you can store it. You know you're not going to lose it. Then those are the apps, Evnote, Digo, PowerNote, and Thinking Space are the apps to use for that. Or at least those are the apps that I use for that. Next term is long-term memory. Here you're trying to organize lots and lots of information into complex schema, complex organizations. The apps that I think fit into this one are Bundler. It's not necessarily a smartphone app, but Bundler is a website that allows you to curate videos and web content. So you install a little app in Chrome it's called Bundler, and anytime you come across a web page or a video, you can bundle it. So I bundled my videos on urinary and electrolytes. For my daughter, a difficult thing is figuring out soccer feints and turns because there's a lot of different websites that will teach you the different soccer feints. So it's nice. What Bundler does is I found a YouTube video on this particular feint. I found a YouTube video on this particular feint, and I can coordinate all those in a particular website. So it allows you to curate. I think as instructors, that's going to be more and more our job because there's so much information on the web. Our role is going to be curating and teaching students how to curate information on the web is important and valuable and accurate. So I like Bundler as a tool to do that. It's nice too. I guess the reason I'm mentioning it as a smartphone is because we can access Bundler on my smartphone. So when my daughter and I are over at the soccer field, all we have to do is go to Bundler to see these videos. We don't have to go to various websites. We just have to go to Bundler and all of them are curated here. Evernote is an application I'm really, really liking these days because it allows me to store notebooks of information. Kind of already mentioned it, but I'll just go through it a little bit more. I keep various notebooks, home projects, so I'm trying to fix the kitchen floor, or I need to remember to paint the hallway, or I need to take brush to the dump. I keep all that as a to-do list store. They're also it's really nice that I've finally gone paperless in the sense that when I'm going to the hardware store, it's all in Evernote. Or we went to South Dakota, all the itinerary, everything was stored in Evernote. So all the confirmation numbers were right there on my phone, my wife's phone, and the Zoom. Long-term projects, just I jot down ideas that I know I want to come back to. VoiceThread is a video software that allows students or others 
to post notes to the video. So it's a socially collaborative tool. Or they can post video responses. So it's a way to have a video kind of expand into a collaborative environment. And I haven't really had a chance to look at it too much, but I know I want to. And I know I'm safe. I'm not going to forget it because it's in my Evernote. I like to think about TPCK, technology, pedagogy, content, knowledge, teaching from the point of view of let's coordinate all three of these. This was a note. I was walking down to listen to Ken Robinson, and I was thinking about Ken Robinson. He was in Iowa City. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I don't want to lose it. So I record it really quickly on Evernote, and it comes up in Evernote. Keep a, just a small little list of things to, to remember. My smartphone class, that's how I kept that coordinated. And again, the nice thing is it's coordinated across all my computers and my phone. Or again, if I wanted to draw a little picture, I draw, drew a little picture, took a picture of it, and it's in my Evernote. It's safe. I'm not going to lose it now. Bubble loss. I'm a huge concept mapper. I like to see spatial organizations, and I like Bubble loss. It's It's not perfect, but it's the best and most convenient that I've found. For creating huge mind maps. This one's a little bit old, but this is my mind map on what I thought the future of teaching AMP might look like. So I just wanted to brainstorm what AMP teaching might look like in five years. So things I'm looking at is open source. There's so many sources of information. I've just outlined those all here from like Wikipedia is obviously an open source to MT, uh, MIT Open Coursework Hippocampus is another source. Carnegie Mellon has open source learning objectives. So just so that I can track Khan Academy. So just so I can track the various open source tools available now. Virtual schools. I'll, Florida Virtual Schools is a really interesting idea, and I, and I want to explore that more. Things like blended learning, I think really the future of teaching is blended learning, or the reverse classroom where you create these videos, the student listens to them, and then you have discussion in class rather than content delivery in class. I wanted to organize my thoughts on the Horizon Report. The Horizon Report is a technology report on what technologies will, will likely be adopted on a one-year horizon, three-year horizon, and five-year horizon. I like to just put my technology goals so that I can view those quickly. Rather than listing them all out, this kind of spatial organization allows me to look at all my ideas of teaching right now really, really quickly and basically be able to put them into my long-term memory because Bubble Us is creating the organization and it's allowing me to memorize these ideas much more quickly. What am I working on? I mean, ultimately, the whole idea here is the more you can keep thoughts in your head and keep them organized and spinning around, the more likely you are to be creative. My interpretation of creativity is that you have this organization of information that allows you to see connections that other people are not seeing. And the key point to that is organization. And my smartphone obviously helps me do that quite a bit. Step four is still a little bit nebulous because I haven't worked through these completely, but I want to mention that these are the paths that I'm on right now. The first one is how can I create efficiencies in delivering my course content so that it's available on a smartphone so that students can learn on their smartphones. The other one is personal learning networks. How can I set up collaborative environments for myself with other teachers that teach like me or within student groups so that when one of them has a problem, they have someone else in their network that might be able to help them through that. I really think social collaboration, even though it's a very difficult thing, and when we hear social collaboration, we think of group work, and group work never works because of social loafing. I really think social collaboration is the future of teaching and the future of learning and the future of innovation, really. One tool that I really like is the tool that I'm using to make this presentation, which is Prezi. I don't have a video in here yet. It one's coming up. But the thing I like about Prezi is it creates a spatial organization that I think feeds into the brain a little bit better since our brains are spatially organized. It also allows you to deliver text and video. Another thing is I'm following a very specific path, but you can set up Prezi presentation so it follows a path that's, that's specific for a text-based learner, or you could have the student go through just videos if they are video-based learners. So I really like that Prezi has this spatial organization, can incorporate several different types of media, and then you can choose the path how it goes through. So I envision students that are auditory learners and visual learners and text-based learners learning the same objectives, but going through the Prezi in a different way. Another thing I'm going to talk about really briefly is social networking. I think it's really important to create social net networking opportunities for students. So how can I set those up using the smartphone? I would like to do Twitter and tweet to it. Tweet deck, I think that's one way to do it. And also just creating YouTube videos, kind of an ancillary point. Creating YouTube videos is a powerful way for the student to access course content when they might have a free moment. When their kid's in gymnastics class, they can listen to a YouTube quick. Or if they're going to bed at night, or they're watching their kid play on a playground, they can listen to a YouTube quick. So again, these are ideas that I'm trying to come up with. 
then improve the student's access to course content using their smartphones. Adobe Connect is another example. I don't teach online, so I'm not really familiar with KTOS and that kind of teaching, but I'm familiar with Adobe Connect enough to realize that Adobe Connect replaces kind of the satellite system in the sense that the student, if Adobe Connect works on a Zoom, the student does not need to be in the classroom at all. They can be at home accessing the lecture and participating in the lecture using Adobe Connect. This one is really, really nebulous in my head, but it's the idea of setting up networks of collaboration. And I think I've said this before, that we, when we think of network collaboration, we think of groups and someone in the group never works. But as long as everyone has kind of the same goals, then social collaboration is very powerful. This is kind of a figure I found off the net, and this is the way my network work, works right now. All of these arrows are one direction. I'll read blogs, I'll read Reddit or social bookwork, bookmarking sites, I read RSS feeds, I watch other people's Twitter, I can see other people's Google Docs. All this information goes to me, and then I sort that information out for what works for me. But if you create these arrows in multiple directions, I'd like to start sharing my thoughts back by creating a blog. I would like to share Twitter thoughts back. I would like to make these multi-directional arrows. That's really, really powerful if these arrows are two-way because that's true social collaboration where I'm sharing my ideas with other people. They're building on those ideas, feeding ideas back to me, and we're basically innovating by sharing ideas. A term that is often used to describe the power of personal learning networks is the long tail. Now, where the long tail, the term comes from, is in consumerism, is selling things. It's back in the day, mom and pop stores, or even br any brick and mortar store, they don't have infinite storage. So they can't sell you a lot of different things. They need to pick the things that are popular so that they'll make money. So they don't sell a lot of things. They sell things that will sell a lot. With the advent of the internet, there's all kinds of stores now. They don't need to sell a lot of any particular item, but they'll sell a lot of different items. So this company down here, might not sell a whole lot of any one item, but they sell a lot of different items. And the reason that works is they might have warehouses across the country, so they don't necessarily have a storage capacity. They can store whatever they want, or once you buy it from them, they can then get it from the producer in the first place. So here you have limited storage, so you can only sell a few items that are most popular. Out here you can store a lot of items. You don't need to sell a lot of any one particular item because you're gonna sell a lot of different items. How this relates to teaching is I think about my wife who teaches kids with autism who are in seventh and eighth grade. She doesn't have a collaborative cohort there because there's only one other teacher in Iowa City Community Schools that teaches that. But through the internet, she can find other teachers like her and create this collaborative environment. Another example, even though at Kirkwood we have several a and instructors, we don't all necessarily teach the same which is very good because it means the student has choices in, in so far as how they learn. They can try and pick a teacher that meets their learning style, and that's a huge benefit. But as far as collaboration, it's not really helpful because I don't have someone that teaches like I do exactly that I can bounce ideas off of and that we can basically develop ideas together. But through the Internet, I can create social collaborative networks with other people that teach exactly, exactly like I do, and so we can innovate more by bouncing ideas off of each other. Probably the best video to describe this is a TED Talk by Chris Anderson. Blocks. I mean, it's quite brutal. Um, and I'm also a little nervous about this. There are nine billion humans coming our way. And the most optimistic dreams. So I'm not going to play that entire video, but I'm going to highly recommend that you view it. Because what he talks about is how the video has stimulated innovation. And he calls it crowd accelerated innovation. The fact that a lot of people can be looking at the same problem means a lot of different ideas are shared and there's more innovation. Another example that he uses is if you're a unicyclist, you have very little opportunity to be a collaborator. First of all, it kind of needs to be a visual collaboration because you need to see what someone else is doing. But there may not be a lot of unicyclists in your town. But through the beauty of the internet, unicyclists can come together, see what other people are doing with YouTube, and they can innovate much more quickly because they can see what someone else has been doing, and then they can try that trick. Another example he uses is dance, the rapidity of the evolution of dance, now that dancers can see each other, build off of each other's moves, and improve the process, is basically skyrocketing because dance is evolving by allowing other people to see what other people are doing. 
I think teaching is going to go in the same direction. The more you see how other people are teaching, the more you'll be able to filter through, figure out what's worked for you, what's working for your students, and you'll be able to innovate more quickly. So this idea of crowd accelerated innovation, I think is really, really powerful. And the way I interpret it is while group work has its limitations, as long as everybody has very similar goals and are very motivated, which I'm a motivated teacher, if I find other people, that kind of group work can lead to great, great innovation. So that essentially is step four, processes that I'm still working on, developing content that basically is efficient for delivery on smartphone, and then developing personal learning networks. So that's my evolution of my brain on smartphone. Hopefully I'll put this up on YouTube so other people can comment on it, or I can share it before discussions. And again, we can socially collaborate at that point. Thank you.